Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm George Craw. This series features acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some of the biggest questions of our time. Tonight, we return to the, to the pressing issue of climate change. We are joined by Professor and Chair of the Statistics Department, Robert Lund, for an introduction to the problem of change points in climatology and the hazards they present. Before we begin, a few details about tonight's event. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded and available on the university's YouTube channel. Our conversation tonight will be moderated by Herbert Lee, who is a professor of statistics at UC Santa Cruz and has been the vice provost for academic affairs since 2011. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Yale University in 1993 and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in 1998. Before joining the UCSC faculty in 2002, he also completed a postdoc at Duke University. As VPAA, he provides leadership in areas such as program development and resource allocation, as well as overseeing the UCSC laboratorium. His research interests include Bayesian statistics, spatial statistics, and neural networks. Welcome, Professor Lee. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Robert Lund. Robert Lund is a professor and chair of the statistics department at UC Santa Cruz. He received his PhD in statistics from the University of North Carolina in 1993. He is a 2007 elected fellow of the American Statistical Association and was the 2005 through seven editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association, as well as program manager at the National Science Foundation in Washington, DC from 2016 to 2018. He has published over 110 refereed papers and has graduated 24 doctoral students. His research expertise lies in time series, statistical climatology, and stochastic processes. Let's welcome Robert Lunt. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, let me load the screen and ask if all is OK here. That looks good. OK, well, Herbie, George, thank you so much for the introduction. And major thanks for inviting me to speak before you tonight. Uh, I am Robert Lund, Department of Statistics. I came to Cal Santa Cruz about a year and a half ago, right before the pandemic shut us down. Uh, I'm starting to really enjoy the place now as we come out of the pandemic. And um, I, I find it a very academically in a lively place. Tonight, I wanted to speak to you about something that I've devoted uh, probably 20 years of my career on, and it's change point issues, and particularly how they pertain to climate controversies. Now, this is joint work with many scientists over the years, but the prominent ones here that I'll mention are Thomas Fisher, Shang Hung Lee, and Michael Robbins, but there are others. Um, let's see, page down. How can I get, let me, let's get this. Okay, I think we have the page up and page down going. So for an outline of the talk, I will first tell you what a change point is, what, it, what these things are, and, and, and convince you that if we don't get the change point aspects and a lot of data sets correct, that we're going to make unsound and often bogus inferences. Now, the statistician data scientist in me wants to take you through a few slides of math here to take you through a test for the simplest thing of finding just a single mean shift, just if there's one shift in the record, how to do that. Thereafter, I'll transcend into the case where there are multiple shifts. We call this multiple change point analyses, and the situation gets even more nebulous there. 
I'm going to thereafter take you on an actual climate homogenization where we're going to go and we're going to take a look at the new Bedford precipitation series and, and segment it up. And you'll get to a pine and guess how many segments you think there are and we'll check out your, your, your reasoning. If I have time, which I don't really expect that I will, I will do a brief tour of a simulation study to further convince you that the data science under the hood is actually giving you reasonable answers. But perhaps the coup de gras on this talk will be the last section on hurricane and tropical storms, where we've seen increases and renewed concerns about what, what is going on in the Atlantic Basin. And I want to narrate the huge controversy and what a change point analysis leads one, myself a statistician, to conclude uh, about this record. OK, first. Oh, and by the way, if you have any comments or questions, I believe Herbie can take your chat and he can uh, introduce those to me at any time that he sees fit. So I want this to be a largely expository talk. Um, please, please put them in the Q&A. Okay. So first, what is a change point? In a layman vernacular, a change point is just a time where something shifts. So imagine if you were monitoring deaths, traffic highway deaths out on, say, Interstate 5, and somebody changed the speed limit. Laws changed the speed limit, say, from 65 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour. You might believe that that would increase highway fatalities. Well, Often, if you were just given the series of highway fatalities, you may not be shown at the time at which the law changed. And these little change points, they come in climate series, for example, uh, very often a temperature recording station may move across town or the thermometer or something has changed. Now, here in Santa Cruz, if you move inland from the coast, you are going to, your temperature is going to go up quite a few degrees. Climate people have known that because of changes in sun exposure, soil, shadings, and things, even moving a temperature gauge a quarter mile can really shift temperature records a couple degrees. And I'm going to show you some examples of where that happens and the chaos that it induces. But change points are nothing more than times where something changes, as the name would imply. This next slide may be the most, it, it illustrates the basic hazard of change points. What is shown here is annual temperatures from 1900 to 2000 at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, so you can see here that the average temperature is somewhere in there. This is in degrees C. So 17, 18 degrees C is roughly where this series is living as an average value. And what that's as an average value, that's uh, what, 62, 63, somewhere, somewhere in the 60s. Uh, if you were to take this data record, Okay, and put just a line through it, fit a line as statisticians do, you would conclude, you see this solid line here, it has a slope that is slightly negative. It doesn't look to be radically negative, it's just slightly negative, but that represents cooling. But something went on with this record that I wanna talk about now. In 1939, I actually, well, first of all, the Tuscaloosa record is special in that I know what happened to the record. It's not true that with most of our 5,000 USA temperature uh, recording stations that we know, we know specifics of provenance of data. But what we see here is what happened in 1939. They moved the temperature recording station from downtown out to the Black Warrior River Basin, and you see a shift lower. In 1956, the temperature gauge was changed. And there are many different ways to measure temperature, but even if you have uh, uh, what statisticians would call independent and identically distributed um, 
temperature gauges at say lined up in a row at Walmart and you act well here we don't have a Walmart target uh, <laughs> they they can be a couple degrees off and you see the shifts of a couple degrees okay well what happens here is if we allow for a mathematical shift uh, and keep a, a constant slope with the three segments here we went from a conclusion of cooling slightly to a trend that is rapid warming. This is about two degrees centigrade per century of warming. This is bad news. Our conclusion about climate change completely shifted with the knowledge of these breakpoints. So the hopes might be that these breakpoints aren't all that frequent. Unfortunately, they are. Typical US temperature series station, uh, temperature station or weather station has up to six break points per century on average, six on average. Uh, this is a problem. Let me show you another series. Here are New Bedford, Massachusetts annual temperatures. This is a little bit south of Boston, a little bit east of Providence. And what you see are, is an antipodal pattern here, where this time, this is 180 years of data, but if, if we analyze this series without knowledge of the, the breakpoint change point times, I would have concluded the series is warming, where if I account for the shifts in the data record that uh, I actually see some slight cooling. Now, when I was young, and this was probably in the early 1990s, my first jobs were I had I got grants and I my summer job was at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and I showed some of my superiors some of these slides. And at this time, most of the math stats work in the area. We were more interested in quantifying. Uh, the, the rate at which the earth was warming and putting uncertainty margins on this. But these graphs show you the typical change point shenanigans that can get quite bad. If you don't get the change points right, you will not get accurate local trend assessments. Okay, uh, I've probably scared you into thinking, well, how in the world could you ever infer anything about climate now? But now I'm going to work my way towards showing you we can do some things. Okay. The key statistical questions that this talk seeks to address is that we look at a record retrospectively. There are there is a field of sequential change points where, for instance, if you are interested, if you annually screen for, say, prostate cancer, could you detect any changes as quickly as possible? Those we look at records in retrospect, and what we like to do is identify how many change points there there are and at what times the change points occur. Now, some recent references, statistical references, I'll, I'll go through these at the end. And incidentally, if anyone wants a copy of this talk, just write me. I'll be happy to give you the slides or whatnot. And all these references are listed in detail. OK, so. As a statistician, climate scientist, data scientist, I need to talk about a ground zero model that we can measure change points from. And think of X sub T as being the temperature of year T. And I'm gonna write this as an overall location parameter mu that does not change delta T, delta standing for shifts. These, this is gonna be my shift structure and epsilon t, where epsilon is, is random. Uh, statisticians work with random errors, and we call this a time series regression model. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the components in this model on the next slide, but, well, let's, let's actually do that. Here, here the, the mean shift structure is parameterized as follows there will be m total change point times in our data record of size capital N. For a statistician, n always re represents the sample size. The first change point time, which we don't know, occurs at time tau sub one, the second at tau two, 
through tau m. We do not know m, the number of change points, and we do not know the change point time. But what is written here in this equation is just sort of piecewise mean shifts. I'm trying to, uh, I, I have to impose that the first shift is zero because I have a mean parameter in there and I, uh, I need an identifiable model. But at time tau one, the mean shifts up or down by delta two, okay? So that's the shift structure, okay? And I have to estimate where the shifts are. I wanna estimate the taus, I wanna estimate the changes and uh, how many change points there are. Uh, I won't get deep into time series theory in this talk, but suffice it to say, climate data are correlated. Uh, you get a hot day like today, and it, in, incidentally, I'm speaking about warming and climate change on the hottest day of the year here, uh, but you get a hot day, tomorrow's typically hot too. Get a cold day today, tomorrow's typically cold as well. Uh, there is correlation and you need to put correlation in the statistical errors or you can get into trouble with change point analysis. Okay, so I'm not going to do that, uh, get deeply into how I do that. But I need to flash three slides on you and then I'll be done with most of the technicalities of this talk. Uh, about how one would how a data scientist actually hunts for change points in a data record. And I want to reduce to the simplest case where we have to make a conclusion of either this data record is homogeneous, no change points, or there is exactly one change point. Okay. So I'm going to go through a, 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 a no trend independent errors and walk you through how to do that. Oops, page up. Well, okay. The whole thing is that we don't know the possible change point time. So let's suppose it occurs at time K. Well, what should I do? Let's average up the data before time K. Here we go. And let's average the data after time K. And if those two difference, if the difference between those two sample means is large or statistically significantly different from zero, I would think that that has evidence of being a change, time K being a change point. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now here's a fly in the ointment. The segment up to time k is made from k data points, and the segment after time k is made from n minus k data points. So a statistician needs to scale the x bars somehow, some way. And what this comes out to is what we call a cumulative sum, a dk statistic that looks like this. Now, there won't be a test on the math, but this is essentially a difference between the two x bars scaled for the number of, you see a k over n and a square root of n, and you see a, a sigma hat, which is just the sample standard deviation of all data points, okay? So the inference here, if d sub k is, too large, I'm going to, in absolute value, I am going to conclude a change point at time k. Almost done with the technical stuff. Here is maybe the coup de grace slide for a one change point. I don't know what time k is for the change point. So what I'll do is time, time one can't be a change point, but any time between two and n can be a change point. So I'll make a statistic that takes the largest discrepancy, the largest absolute value of dk. Now, this means I'm taking a maximum. And for statisticians, this typically invokes fear because you're getting to some things like extreme values and other things. We're not talking about averages, we're talking about maximums. And this sort of makes change point theory a little bit hard for statisticians. But there is a famous result. 
this Q statistic as capital N goes to infinity converges to a distribution that statisticians can quantify. And what is it? Well, it turns out to be the largest absolute value of what we call a Brownian bridge. Now that's a mouthful. A Brownian bridge is made from Brownian motion, the famous process that Einstein invented. Uh, as, as I said, it's not really all that important. Uh, but here is, if you want to make conclusions with 95% confidence level, the magic value of Q is 1.30, okay? If this Q statistic is bigger than 1.30, you'll conclude that there's a change point. Okay, let me show you how this works on data. This was actually a master's project in my, by one of my students in our department last week. And this is the Central England Temperature Series. It's a composite series averaged of about 15 different series uh, located in the Central England region. And the place where the largest QSUM or DK statistic occurred was right here in 1988. OK, and where we went from a sample average of 10.22, I'm sorry, 9.45 before and 10.22 afterwards. So this is all in C degrees centigrade. So that that's a that's a pretty big shift. Anyone think you think that's significant? Well, <laughs> it looked it sort of looks so, but we need to go and make we need to go and compute that Q statistic. So at 1988, we had a value of about, that looks to be about what? 1.65, 1.7. And so at 95%, that exceeds 1.30. So yeah, you would conclude a change point in the uh, Central England record at time 1988. So I just walked you through how a statistician does a single zero one change point. Let me stop here and break for any questions that might come up. So we do have a question from the audience asking, okay. have you ever analyzed the raw current data from nanopore sequencing? Much of the problem is segmenting the data for up to 1 million or so change points. Oh, no, I haven't. But I, I would love to hear about this. Uh, I, I have segmented speech. I have segmented finance data. I have segmented snowfalls and uh, precipitation, sunlight, all sorts of things, but not nanopores. <laughs> all right. Um, see if any other anything else comes in. I'll, I'll ask you another question. Um, it looks like there is a change here in the central England um, temperatures. What do you think caused that change? Well, generally, this is attributed to the Industrial Revolution and uh, global warming. Uh, about 1950, we started pouring CO2 into the air, and you could you you can start you can see the record. Oops, what did I do? I did something. Uh, am I crazy, or did the screen? It got a little smaller, yeah. Does anyone know what I did? Oh, that's I'm clicking on it and see if that helps anything. No. Oh, that's disturbing. I'm not sure what I did. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. We pause this talk for technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the in in the uh, about the mid. 1900s, we, we started uh, putting CO2 into the air and uh, the, the atmosphere really started to warm up. And because this model don't, doesn't have a linear trend or any other type of trend, what you're seeing is a change point test trying to adjust to an increase by putting a mean shift right in the middle of where it would probably be better described as more of a trend feature in the data. But thanks for asking. All right, a couple more questions came in. Okay. Um, how do we know that this is not the behavior of the time series itself? For example, a jump in a cyclical series. 
ah, so is this man-made? It's not clear. So that is an, an, another entire field called change point attribution. And I'll say some few, a few more words about this. Typically, uh, the Central England series is a composite series. But if I was looking to finger changes in, say, Santa Cruz, I would probably take the Santa Cruz record, subtract it from the Monterey record down the road or maybe the Watsonville and be looking for changes in that. Then most of what you would see, because we experience similar weather, we, you could finger changes or attribute changes in differences of series to more type of instrument mental changes and rather not natural type variability. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. Okay, good. Um, another question. Do you work with strange attractors? Well, uh, <laughs> strangely, no. That's a physics question. My brother would ask me that. He's a physicist. No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, what value of D tells you that a change point is concerning? Well, we would ordinarily we would get a p-value in this, and uh, so this one is significant with uh, significance less than five percent. If I remember my uh, Q tables right, we're probably talking about this is a, a p-value of maybe two percent here. So this is a little concerning. Now, there's there's we analyze this record as it was independent, and it's really not. There's correlation from year to year. So one would want to do a more careful analysis, but this is getting borderline significant here. All right, let me take one more question before we move on. Um, how to balance false discoveries against false omissions in inferring change points? Ooh. Doesn't that require assessing the losses from each mistake? And if so, how do we do that? Ooh, we're going to get to a penalized likelihood when we do multiple change points here in a little bit. <laughs> but great question. Uh, unfortunately, okay, so great, great. We just we just went through a single change point test. Nature is much more complicated, right? Typically, we have multiple change points to deal with, and we don't know how many. You think there's a lot of questions about the single change point? This one gets even more complicated. So I, this slide is my technical slide on how to do things, but I'm going to try to be intuitive here. Statisticians, we fit models. Good fitting models give us are more likely. The likelihood is better. The better fitting models have a bigger likelihood, OK? The more parameters that are in a model, the better the model fits, subject to one being a subset of the other. So the more parameters, the higher likelihood, the higher log likelihood, the, smallest, the smaller the minus two log likelihood gets. A penalized likelihood method looks to, to minimize a negative two log likelihood, but here's the thing. I am going to charge you for the parameters that you put down so that I don't get too many false discoveries and, and, and false conclusions here, false positives and false negatives. And the way that statisticians do that is we put a penalty. So the more parameters you put in the model, the bigger your, your penalty is going to be. Now, what we want is the most parsimonious model that fits. So at some point, adding more parameters doesn't increase the, log the likelihood too much, but your penalty goes up. And I'm going to show you how this works with an actual optimization. Now, there are three penalties that I want to acquaint you with. Uh, one is Akaiki information theory, and it says the penalty for putting M change points down is two times M. That's very simple. Bayesian information criteria says that if you want to put down M change points, you charge it M times the log N. MDL stands for minimal description length. This came out in 2006, and I've been working with it since, and it is much more involved. It is telling you to charge things depending on where you place the change point times. You see how these two penalties are just proportional to the number of change points there. The more you put, the more 
you charge as a linear function of m this one is much more much more involved and has to deal with you would think that change points that occur close together should be penalized higher than sparsely placed change points okay so now here's where i want to get to the audience and i want you to visually look at think about how many segments are in this graph too I want to run a poll, and can I run the poll, Herbie, or have you got to do that? How many, how many, uh, can we move that there? How many, um, how many segments do you see in this series? And I'm going to walk you through an actual homogenization here. If, if the poll has popped up over the graph, um, you can move the poll on your own screen. Yeah, so I did. Graph I did. Look at it. I'm not allowed to vote. Maybe another fifteen seconds. You won't you you won't lose any points if you get I, I've had people guess 10 and people guess zero here. Okay, so we're gonna oh okay, interesting. Who is right? Well, we're about to find. Uh I won't give it away just yet. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so first I have to tell you how we set a likelihood for such a such a precipitation series. Uh, th that was uh, New Bedford precipitations, which is back east. They don't have uh, zero precipitations like we get around here for a month where it doesn't rain at all. But anyway, to model annual precipitation, climate people typically use log normal distributions, which means I need to take the log of the data and fit a Gaussian time series model to that. Now that sounds hard, but I'm in time series. And for me, that's easeful toil. I am going to use an MDL penalty and show you what we get. Okay. So what I did here is an exhaustive optimization for each change point candidate change point time between 1820 and 2000, this is 180 years of data, I went through and I computed what MDL told me was the best change point time. So change point configuration. So if you were to tell me you wanted a change point configuration with only one change point, we would be putting it, oh, about 19, uh, I believe circa mid 1960s there. Okay, so that's one of them. There's the best two seg uh, three segment, two change point configuration. Okay, it kept the circa 1960 change point and it put another one right there. Okay, and this is exhaustive uh, uh, model search. So we know that this is, these, these values are the best. Okay, let's do one more. That to me is starting to look real good, isn't it? Okay, it, it uh, is still keeping this change point here in the 60s. And I'm going to say more about that in a second. And you might be thinking, well, we're getting close to what uh, a good answer is here. But let me show you what happens next. Something really, five segment models. Let me go back to four segments. Anyone see what happens right around here? Turns out New England was under an historic drought in the late 1960s, okay? And MDL is actually picking up a very short two-year event with this drought. Now, MDL is information theory. It doesn't work on statistical limit theory. So this could actually be a feature in the data. Now, another thing to note is that this optimization becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, there are 180 different data points. If you were to just do 
put down three change points for the four segment models, 180 choose three. There's different models you have to fit. That's about a million different time series optimizations. This five segment model took me about a month to fit on my laptop. It would have been about a week, but my dog kept stepping on the laptop and restarting the computer. But um, it is an exhaustive optimization. Six segment models. This one is really difficult to see, but right here where this hand is, it puts a one year segment right there. If you have an eagle eye, you can see that. Okay. And let's see what the MDL scores are. Remember, we were supposed to minimize this, and it looked like minus 309.8570 is the smallest MDL score. And hey, guess what? That is the five segment model. And it kept that very short segment between 1965 and 1966. So how about that? Uh, that's how the technology under the hood works here. Uh, did I put, no, I did not put a fit. Well, I guess I can show you. This was the best fit, including this. Okay, now it so happens that we don't believe that this change point is due to anything natural. So typically what one would do is you would take the New Bedford data and you would subtract it from say Boston, Massachusetts or Fall River, Massachusetts is, is nearby and you would take a different series and you would see if some of these change points show up before you start adjusting data. How to adjust the data? Uh, I'm in touch with a lot of people at the National Climatic uh, Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina, that actually have to do this for a living. They use a lot of these types of algorithms, and their job is to make all these comparisons. It is a huge data science endeavor. Let me stop here and ask if there are any questions before I assess what time we have left. 20 minutes, I think, to get to hurricanes. So there are a couple questions from the audience. There's actually two that both relate to the question about um, these plots are looking at, or this, this process you're walking us through, are looking at just changes in the mean, um, as opposed to where there's uh, trends in time or piecewise linear functions. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that, um, particularly given that some of your earlier plots did show uh, piecewise linear functions. Yes. Boy, you all are asking great questions. So this is this is without a linear trend in the data. So it turns out if you put a linear trend in the data or allow linear trends in each regime, the analysis becomes completely different. And I am concentrating on mean shifts here just to keep things simple. There are mean shift models with trends. I, I, am, I am about to publish a paper on the Central England temperature series that does trend shift models, but things get a little bit harder. And unfortunately in the field of change point analysis, the limit distribution and the analysis actually changes a good bit for each different type ground zero regression function you, you put. But we could have done this with trends. It turns out if you do this with the New Bedford data, you'll conclude that there isn't much there with the trends, okay? That mostly what is going on is with the shifts with the mean. But that's a, a great question. I hope I, I, I didn't do justice to it, but in, in the interest of time, I, I'll, I'll move on. All right, question. Should ecologists like myself abandon AIC and go to MDL? Um, depends, depends, what, depends what you're doing. Okay, AIC is famous for selecting models that have too many parameters. In terms of change points, it's, it, it's a disaster. It tends to select three or f twice as many change points um, uh, as needed. Now, I have a graduate student, a postdoc, I'm sorry, a postdoc student here who is trying to fix AIC for this because it's so common. But in general, in most statistical walks, AIC is one of the poorer penalties to use in selecting a regression function. I'll definitely refer you to BIC as a better all-around penalty. And, and if you're interested, if you need to talk to me about what might be some other be pe better penalties for your scenario, send me an email because I, I've investigated lots of these things over the years. 
All right, and then we have one more that it looks like a little bit more like a comment, but we can frame it as a question. Um, penalized likelihood, um, none of the complexity penalties mentioned directly relate to real world losses, such as falsely declaring a change point or missing a real change point. Do you have any comment on that? Right, uh, falsely declaring a change point here is something we wanna avoid because what happens if we falsely declare a change point the, the people at the NCDC will actually go and they'll make these little adjustments to the series. Well, what happens when you do that? You're eliminating variability in the series. So if you adjust for too many change points, if, if you we really don't want to flag too many change points. Uh, uh, in, in terms of an actual loss, you would have to tell me what you're looking to insure against. So I could give you some sort of expectation measure and uh, utility function things. And then I could probably come up with something, but the, these are good questions. In general, the field feels that we should not be making adjustments to series for too many change points, because when you eliminate this variability, then you think things in the future are significant when they're really not. Okay, let me uh, actually try to get on. Um, you know, most of the time I would, I, I actually, as a statistician, this is a bit different talk because I showed you how the methods work on a data where we don't know the answers. And then I would show you how uh, usually we do things on a simulation where I show you under a controlled environment how things work. But let me do this one slide very quickly. What I did is I set up a simulation experiment and generated 1,000 series of length 200. And I set all the specification of the New Bedford data, correlation from year to year, 0.2, log mean 6.8. And what I did is I ran uh, MDL on each and every one of these thousand series. And here's what it came back. We were ask, asking about errors and things. Uh, in 990 of the runs, so the right answer is there's no change points in this series. This is a control run. And MDL gave me the right answer, 990 out of the thousand runs. In four out of the thousand, it gave me the erroneous answer that there's one change point. Five of them, it told me there's two. And I believe actually one of the runs, it gave me four change points. So it's doing pretty well. It's, I mean, it's getting the right answer 99% of the time. Uh, I could give you more on simulations and show you that what this stuff is doing. And, uh, but I'm a bit worried that I'm running short of time and I'd really like to get to the controversies. So allow me to uh, continue and I'll be happy to answer any questions or go through those slides if I need to after the talk. Okay, well, modern climate people, we, we, we're pretty much in agreement the earth is warming up. You, there's a few holdouts, but our best guesstimate of the rate of change is somewhere about 1.3, 1.4 degrees, 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit per century. Now, what we are starting to look at are other climate quantities. And if you've heard all the news about the Atlantic Basin tropical cyclone counts, tropical cyclones are tropical storms that form near the equator and move north. What a tropical cyclone or hurricane is, is essentially the Earth's mechanism of sweating. It is a mechanism whereby heat is moved from the equator up to the poles in an attempt to keep the earth at a constant temperature, akin to maybe a summer thunderstorm on a hot day back east. Well, this record here, oh, okay, so as the world has warmed, the oceans have warmed. There is more heat to dissipate. So given that, we honestly expect that we're either going to get more tropical cyclones or the individual storms are going to get stronger. Now, this is the huge controversy. Which one is happening? Because we need to know this for insurance aspects. So let me show you the data here and let's get into this. This is the counts from the 1850. And this screen is a little bit busy, but I've broken it down into tropical cyclones. A tropical cyclone's gotta have a peak wind speed of 40 miles an hour. 
I've broken it down to the, the gray shade, the light gray shade is just hurricanes. Saffir Simpson category one and two. That's a storm that achieves 74 miles an hour to 110 miles an hour peak wind speed. And the dark shaded is our record of the counts of the strong hurricane, Saffir Simpson category three and above, which means at some time, such a storm had it to be, um, had to make a, a wind speed, sustained wind speed of 111 miles an hour or more. Well, what's the controversy? Um, the climate people keep telling us that they expect that there will not be more hurricanes in the future, but they might get a bit stronger. Okay, in particular, people who study this, uh, Kelvin Dragemeyer, I was listening to his Senate testimony uh, a couple years back, and he made the statement that hurricanes will become a bit stronger, but there will, will not be more of them in the future. Well, what was his rationale for the statement? Well, he is basing off this statement off of uh, the climate community's global climate models, where they make mathematical models of what's going on, and they study the Earth through these models. I'll also mention that he's Trump's science advisor, and uh, that in terms of, I don't know how to say this, but to just be blunt, if you're in climate and you were associated with Trump, there's uh, there's issues. Uh, there is a popular book on this controversy called Storm World. And if you ever want to read about the modern climate controversy, it's by Chris Mooney. It's not the greatest book in the world, but it's got so many cool things about political mudslinging. Uh, it, it talks about lots of people that I know, and I, I found it a fascinating read. But as a statistician, I want to try to weigh in on what I see on this controversy. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I am going to model the counts. This is count data. It's not continuous. A count is something that takes the values of 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 like car wrecks, number of fish you catch, number of runs scored in a baseball game. Uh, the canonical count distribution for a statistician is Poisson, which is in, was designed to study counts of fish. Uh, with the Atlantic Basin, I'm not going to get into the Pacific Basin, but with the Atlantic Basin, no correlation is seemingly needed from year to year. If there actually was correlation, we would be able to forecast annual counts much better than we currently do. In fact, it's only in May and May where they give us the forecast for this coming summer. Now, if you're interested in math, there's a couple references on how to deal with change points and categorical data. But let me just tell you briefly the model. Here is the Poisson count distribution. It's a count running from 0, 1, 2. And this is the famous e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k, k factorial. And what I'm going to do for a model here is I'm going to take xt for each year t to be independent because we don't see correlation Poisson, but I'm going to let the lambda parameter change. Oops, I'm sorry, I've got a hair trigger on this, on, on my World War II laptop here. But I'm going to let the lambda parameter shift. The lambda parameter is the mean of the Poisson model. So this is, again, mean shift models. OK. Uh, I could tell you. Uh, that you can do some explicit calculations to get log likelihood. The MDL penalty that I'm using oops, is still the same. And so I won't belabor this slide given the day, but let's get to what we're seeing. Here is the total count segmentation. So the first question, is this data homogenous? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight segments, no. No, this is anything but homogenous data. So isn't it cool that a change point test can be used to check whether your data is homogenous? Now, you can also see this is the total counts, and maybe it's clear. 
Remember in 2006 when we ran out of Roman letters to name the storms? Yeah, well, it also happened in last year. And wouldn't you know it, I ran the study one year before that, and it was an attempt to update things. It was a request from other people to update previous papers to the modern uh, data. Now, folks, some of my climate friends always get disturbed when they see outliers like these small segments. So what I did for them is I reran the analysis and made a restriction that the segments had to be at least five years in length. And this was the segmentation that came up. And this, uh, I'll just call it the last plot, getting rid of outliers. Again, we do, we see four different distinct levels. And let me go through some attributions. The first shift upwards in the 1930s sort of makes sense. Okay, in the old days of this storm of uh, of this record, hurricanes could form out over the open waters of the North Atlantic, never get detected and and decay. Once the 1930s rolled around and we started things like aircraft reconnaissance, and then we had World War II, where we had increased shipping traffic out there, we didn't miss as much. So a shift there seems natural. The shift downwards in the 1960s, we still debate. I don't really have a good explanation for it. This is the troubling rascal here. The shift circa 1995 that is going to show up in every one of these graphics, where we transcended in an, into a new period of increased hurricane activity Okay, that we have yet to get out of. Let's do this analysis and let's look at not only uh, the total tropical cyclones, which includes all tropical cyclones, hurricanes, major hurricanes, but let's just look at hurricanes and major hurricanes. <coughs> you see sort of the same thing, both 1995, we have a change point up. I will uh, redo the plots, imposing a minimum uh, Segment length of five years, again, 1995. It's a year that we know the North Atlantic really showed warming. I don't really know what caused it, but the climate people all say, oh, well, that's the year the North Atlantic really, really warmed. And we see this increased activity, okay? And this is, this is a bit troublesome, okay? So, and by the way, this is saying that we are seeing an increase in the total number of storms and not only the total number, major hurricanes and, and relative hurricanes. Climate people are also interested in accumulated cyclone energy. And what they do here is they'll take the size of the storm, its wind speed, its radius to maximum winds, and they'll come up with an energy for the storm and they will follow the storm's track and and segment it up into six hour increments, sum that over all storms tracks during their life. And they will also sum um, all storms over a calendar year. And you get what is called accumulated cyclone energy. This is not counts, but this is a Gaussian segmentation. And you see again, the 1995 change upwards that is so problematic for us. Um, so a couple things. Um, we tried to segment the storm wind speeds up and try as we might, we did not find any change points in the peak wind speeds of the storms. So I had a conversation with the former uh, director of the National Hurricane Center and he shook my hand for this. He, he, he had the coolest name. It was Chris Landsey, L-A-N-D-S-E-A. -E he named his first son Aaron, by the way, which I thought was <laughs> Aaron Landsey. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but what he told me is that they had actually done a reanalysis of all the wind speeds of the storm. So, for example, Hurricane Camille was originally estimated to come land in past Christian Mississippi in 1965, and the original estimate of its landfalling wind speed was 210 miles an hour. Nowadays, we know it was more like something like 180. Um, miles an hour. So what they did, the National Hurricane Center, it did is they found, they went and they did this reanalysis and they adjusted all their published wind speeds. This said, Elsner, Kossin, and Yager in 2008 reported that they did find some things. Uh, the only thing that we could find was a change point at right at 1900, and it turned out that they only did a reanalysis, so to speak, of the day, data points post-1900. So Lancy was very happy that we can confirm that we saw differences uh, before and after 1900, but nothing thereafter. Okay. Um, I guess the overall conclusion is that we're finding... Um, we don't find any change points in the peak wind speeds at all, uh, but we are finding that the storm wind, storm counts are actually going up. So we're finding exactly the opposite of Drager Meyer's claims. And that's the last bit of science I want to throw at you here. I think I want to open it up for questions. I have three slides of references. If anybody is keeping score at home or wants these references, I'll be happy to give you all the references uh, for this talk. The Storm World book is actually an interesting read, but I think I am almost done and I'd rather spend, I'm done and I'd rather spend time answering your questions. Great, thank you very much, Robert. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, could we use the same technique to identify outliers? Yes. <laughs> and if those outlier, if singletons are outliers, would it make sense to remove them and reestimate? Yes. <laughs> yes. Or, or you have to understand why they're being deemed an outlier. So when we put when we put a model down for a likelihood, we're putting a particular statistical distribution down. So MDL information theory might be just saying, hey, there's a year that doesn't make sense if your model is truly Poisson, but it's telling you, it's fingering these outliers. So you may want to change your probability model or some other things, but yes, and yes to both those questions. Uh, so we got a, a question asking to, to actually see the rest of your simulation results, including example where there are change points in the known locations. Okay, I can comply with that. Uh, all right. So here is a case where, uh, let's see, what did I do? I put three change points equally spaced move the log mean from 6.8 to 50 at time, I'm sorry, to seven at time 50, moved it up at time 100 to 7.2, and moved it up to 150 at time, uh, moved it up to 7.4 at time 150. So in truth, there are three change points in this record. MDL got it right, 631 out of the thousand runs. We tend to underestimate rather than overestimate. Uh, currently, it doesn't look great, but this beats almost all the other penalized likelihoods that we, we could find. If you're interested in where it put the change point times, here's a histogram showing you it did it right at 50, 100, and 150. So it's, it's working. It, the technology under the hood is working quite well on simulated data and on real data. Well, we never know the truth with real data. OK, great. Um Question, do you know if the change points are similar for the Pacific? Oh, man. Oh, man. No, no. Here's the thing. The Pacific, the data is so bad until we want launch the GO satellite, the geosynchronous Earth observation satellites, where uh, particularly GOES West, the data before 1970 is flat, not unusable. 
it, it, I'm, it's flat. It's flat, unusable. Uh, um, the interesting thing that we're finding about the Pacific in the modern era is when the Atlantic Ocean is open for business and has a lot of hurricanes that are going up the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, or at least the Eastern Pacific, tends to shut down. And vice versa, when you get a lot of Pacific hurricanes, uh, you, you see, um, um, when you get a lot of Pacific, you see little activity in the Atlantic. And a paper detailing that is multivariate Poisson count time series, where we actually look at both Ocean, ba uh, ocean basins in tandem, and this appeared very recently in the Annals of Applied Statistics. But you all are asking great questions, I got to say. <laughs> okay, next one says, nice talk. For the California precipitation, the climate modelers seem to be telling us that the average precipitation across the models does not seem to change, but there should be more precipitation extremes, droughts, and floods. Have you ever done change point analyses for variants or extremes? Uh, Yes, but not on California precipitation data. The people who are interested in change points in the variability of a series, okay, typically what you do is you subtract the mean and you uh, then look at the square of the series and that gets you to the variability and you can just run square the series and run a mean shift test. There's better things to do, but the finance community is particularly interested in stock volatility in terms of change points in the volatility or the variance of the series. So I have looked at that, but not any precipitation uh, series. Um, at least more so in California. I have I have been getting into the question of snowfall change points because snowfall is so hard to measure. Uh, you move a recording station. Well, if you look, if you record snow up against the fence in somebody's backyard in North Dakota, it can be a foot and a half deep. And then out in the middle of the yard in the grass, it can be thinner than my hairline up here. It, uh, uh, the, the change point issues are going to be drastic there. And we, we, we just don't know what's going on with snow. For whatever reason, we're getting as much heavy snow. It, it doesn't seem to be receding. Uh, but no, I have not looked at California precipitation, but I've only been here for a year and a half. So you got to give me some time. Okay. Um, in 1991, Pinatubo erupted. Did this perhaps pause a more global gradual, uh, gradual change? Yes, it did. And in some of these, uh, actually, it was 1988. And in some of these papers, uh, a general test, regression, change point test for time series data, you can see us right here in uh, going and fingering that change point on the Mauna Loa carbon dioxide series. But you're entirely correct. I think it was uh, 88, not 91, where the Pin Pinatubo went off. And you definitely see the change point. It knocked back a lot of the uh, series, OK? Uh, and there's various modeling ways to handle that. Uh, but hey, I'm in with the references. But uh, the best way to pick that up or see that, or a great way to see that is in this reference here that it shows you how to deal with that, uh, with the Mauna Loa carbon dioxide series, which is the longest record, carbon dioxide record in the world. Okay, technical question. Was there really no Poisson over dispersion in the hurricane data? Ha. Huh. Another great one. The sample mean and the sample variance of the Atlantic are really, really close. There's a little bit of over dispersion in the Pacific, but not much. Uh, but that's also quantified in this, uh, where the, I, I believe we even took over dispersed distributions. I'm a count time series modeler. So we go to things like negative binomial and generalized Poisson is probably the canonical over dispersed count time series model. But the Atlantic are, it, it's uncanny how close they are to being the variance being the mean. So why is the model assuming horizontality uh, interspersed with instantaneous shifts um, better than assuming gradual change and doing a linear or nonlinear regression for detecting changes? Sure. So should I be fitting other 
so let's go back to this model, uh, the general model. So let's see, you, your comment here is I should put xt is a function of time t plus delta t. That's right. And if you tell me the function of time t there, I'll be happy to do the change point analysis for you. But when you have to estimate the function in tandem with the change points, awful things start happening. <laughs> and the problem gets really hard. But yes, uh, we do this mainly for simplicity in a talk like this. And also because the climate community is, they have a physically, they, they have these station relocations and thermometer changes where a mean shift actually makes sense to them. If we were doing speech recognition or something else, we would need to be doing a change point analysis of autocovariance functions and things like that. But for just simple climate things, uh, the mean shifts tend to be the major workhorse. What should we expect in the future? Will there be another change point? Uh, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Would you believe that the idea, you would think in modern technology that change points would be becoming less and less common, but what's happening is they're changing the, the way that we measure temperatures ever more rapidly. It used to be that uh, uh, cotton region shelter was the typical way to measure temperatures. Now we have spring loaded gauges, automatic censoring observation systems, and so many things uh, where technology is changing. And every one of these can actually shift temperatures. Uh, we have examples of change points that we attribute in Canada's change from the English to the metric system, believe it or not. <laughs> We are going to see more change points. It's distressing that they're getting more numerous and not less numerous. Okay, next question. If I understand correctly, a change point can be a change in measurement or a change in dynamics. With carbon dioxide trending up, change point analysis might detect tipping points where there are sudden changes in dynamics. Is that right? Yes. Yes, a change point is the canonical model for a shift. Now, don't believe that I'm against modeling things with continuous response regression functions. Typically, when a climate scientist goes and we, we, we posit some mean shift model, what we're doing is we're rejecting homogeneity when we start concluding that there's a bunch of mean shifts. The next qu natural question is like, well, how are things changing? Can you give me some sort of function here that maybe we're following? for the mean. How should the earth be warming up? These type of things. So really, uh, don't get the idea that I'm against uh, anything other than mean shifts here, because most of my current research is how to get a lot of these classical methods to other types of regression functions. And unfortunately for change point analyses, it is a terrible, terrible fact that every time you change the regression function in just a simple test for a single mean, the limit distribution changes. It's an awful thing. It's not the supremum of a Brownian bridge anymore, but it's the supremum of a Brown, uh, Gaussian process with certain characteristics. Okay, the next two questions are asking about prediction. So first, can your model make useful predictions over say the next 10 years? Yeah, if there are no change points. Uh, in fact, temperature insurance treaties, like suppose you're trying to um, insure uh, against a hot Chicago summer, uh, we can make a prediction for you. I mean, we latch hold of the correlation, but it, and things like that. And we're getting better at predicting at least long-term weather trends. Now predicting, 10 years into the future, well, you don't, you don't trust a 14-day weather forecast, right? Much less a, a 10-year. But uh, for the temperature insurance treaties that are typically written, they will have incredible stipulations on what can be done with the gauge and how it is measured, because it is the deal in setting these price treaties. And Wall Street now knows this with the temperature reinsurance bonds and stuff. 
All right, and do you need to assume the, st the series is stationary? If so, can you predict forecast? If not, how do we know that this is not a coincidence since it happened only once in history? Well, okay, okay. In some of these uh, cases, like in this model here, the statistical time series will be stationary. Okay, now, uh, if you want something else there, it's not a big deal because if you just give me what the correlation function of the epsilon t is, I'm able to use that because I'm a time series guy and I make best linear predictions and I, I look at discrepancies against these shifts here is how the model works. So it's not really important for the epsilon t's to be stationary. Indeed, when I model daily data that has a strong seasonal cycle and stuff, none of the data is stationary. So there are advances to that. But in a simple world for annual data, we like to think it is at least the action is going on with the mean and the, 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 the error process is somewhat of a, uh, a background nuisance thing that you've got to deal with to make inferences. All right, we're actually at the end of the audience questions at this point. Um, I'll just prompt the audience in case there's any last questions or, or George, did you want to ask a question? Came on to say how much I enjoyed the presentation from, from, from Robert and you, Harry. Thank you very much for this. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me know if you want to repeat. <laughs> I can't believe the questions. I've got a lot. If these people are from the university, I want to meet them. <laughs> well, we have a wide audience, Robert. And I will remind everyone that we, we have the presentation will be on YouTube. And I believe Robert has offered to give a, a written transcript of it along with his, uh, with, his, uh, with his slides for anyone who's interested. They can. Uh, write our, our um, write uh, the university event for, for that. Um, I do want to thank uh, both Robert and Herbie for joining us tonight. We will be taking a break uh, next month, but please join us when we return on August 18th with Assistant Professor Shiba Abisa to explore how statistical or artificial intelligence uh, guided data processing can be deployed to enhance image quality and resolution uh, of medical imaging. Good night, everyone. Thank you.